Dairy goat farming is an industry that not a lot of people know much about. But actually, New Zealand dairy goat milk infant formula is highly sought after all around the world. Today, I'm going to find out where the milk that these girls make ends up, thanks to the help of the New Zealand Dairy Goat Cooperative. We're a collective of dairy goat farmers, we're a cooperative, but we're, we're basically in the infant formula business. So we've set up our facilities here to make infant formula from goat milk. Um, so we've got four different uh, manufacturing facilities here. We've got a spray dryer, we've got a, a blending plant, we've got a canning plant and we've got a can making plant as well. And basically that, that process through those four factories um, takes the raw liquid milk, uh, turns it into a formula powder, blends in other ingredients and has it ready in a final can, ready for market, ready to be exported in that, in that final consumer pack. So we do all that here on site. Uh, basically the milk comes in through the, with the milk tanker um, in the morning and that this milk doesn't leave the plant until it's um, uh, in a fully, fully made up infant formula pack ready for export. What happens in detail at each of those stages? The, the process starts with the tanker arriving. Uh, we have three or four tankers coming in each day. Um, that milk is then uh, dropped off into silos and then waiting for batching into an infant formula. The two spray drying plants that we have here, the first one built in 2003 and the second one built in 2014, then have the job of taking that batched up formula, which has had vegetable oils and other ingredients and vitamins and minerals added, and turning it into um, an infant formula powder. So that's the spray drying step. Uh, the next step is a dry blending step, where that powder is taken uh, from the spray dryers and other ingredients are added in a dry mix. The next part of the process is, is our can filling plant, um, and that is the plant where um, we take the powder from the blending plant uh, we put it into the, into the cans uh, with the scoop, um, we put it into a carton and we have it containerized. But a really important part of that process as well is our fourth manufacturing plant, which is a can manufacturing plant. We actually make our own cans here. And basically in that process, uh, we have pre-printed um, sheets of tin plate and those are formed into cans, into round barrels, um, ready to be sent to our can filling plant. So that's our, that's our four plants, those are all integral to each other and um, we've had the can uh, filling plant since 2008 um, and the can making plant since 2013. The cooperative began in uh, 1984, uh, so just over 30 years ago and basically uh, began with a, with a group of uh, dairy goat farmers um, who were seeking to get together in a cooperative and finding something useful to, to make for, uh, from their goat milk. Um, goat milk traditionally has uh, been believed to have many properties which are suitable for easier digestion and so on. And in the late 1980s, um, the company actually pioneered and developed um, the, the goat milk based infant formula and was actually the first company in the world to do so. And things basically, basically took off from there. Uh, since that point, we've um, tried to put an, uh, the goat milk formula into a number of different markets around the world. So we've had very much a product development and market development focus. And as we've gone along, we've been able to build our manufacturing facilities here in Hamilton as well. And we have uh, four different manufacturing facilities on our site here. So we've, we've got uh, 72 shareholding suppliers uh, in the cooperative at the moment. Uh, that's grown quite rapidly in the last three or four years. Uh, in fact, 24 new shareholders in the last three years. Uh, we operate what we refer to as a market-led philosophy here in that we, we ask for milk to come in which we believe will um, sustain our expected sales level. So it's not a production first mentality, it's a, a sales first mentality. So um, in, in recent times we've grown quite quickly and brought new farmers into the cooperative and uh, continued our market development uh, process. We've got about uh, 200 staff here now uh, with the four manufacturing plants uh, and a number of people in our office here who are mainly involved in uh, product development, uh, quality control, that sort of thing, and the usual administrative services. But, but most of the plants are actually operating two or three or even four shifts sometimes, so we've got quite a number of manufacturing staff here on the premises as well. What was the process and discussion, um, I guess, prior in leading into establishing the plant here? Because it's obviously a huge investment. Um, how long was it in the planning? A very long time in the planning and in fact uh, the first um, spray drying plant which was built in 2003 was a really big step for the cooperative. 
Um, back in those days, you know, the turnover might have been, you know, $25, $30 million, and, and this particular plant, you know, cost close to $20 million in those days. So it was a really big, big step for the cooperative. Um, and as we've gone on and as we've grown, each of those extra steps has, has been similarly big step to take. And when we built the spray drying plant, the second one, in 2014, that was actually a $70 million investment uh, across 70 shareholders. So you can get a, uh, an idea of the scale of investment that each of those shareholders has, has put into the business. And in total, we've got about $150 million worth of manufacturing assets now, which we've built up over time. How much milk is coming in here every day, and how much milk powder are you producing? The amount of milk is, is seasonal, but at peak, we're getting close to 200,000 litres a day here. Um, and we make about 10,000 tonnes of finished infant formula um, out, of our, out of our processes here, which works out to be about 12 or 13 million cans of formula a year. And where is that going? So our, our infant formula powder is going to over 20 markets around the world and one of the things that the co-op has really invested in heavily over the last 10 years in particular is, is market development and, and spreading our product uh, across as many markets in the world as possible. Uh, we've got a strong base in Asia, uh, in markets like Taiwan uh, and Korea and Thailand, uh, but we're really pushing into Europe very strongly at the moment. So we would expect in the next uh, three or four years uh, to, to have maybe 35 or 40 markets around the world. Um, we, we keep a very tight focus in our business on, on the goat milk infant formula um, and that's why our, our main growth um, aspiration at the moment is around growing markets through a market development process. Uh, there's many challenges dealing with overseas markets. Um, the infant formula category is the most highly regulated category in the world in terms of food, um, so there's a very high barrier in terms of regulation, so it's not only your own quality standards that you have here, but meeting importing country requirements as well. Um, and there's a lot of international uh, guidelines around formula um, manufacture um, ingredients and um, marketing practices as well that you need to, that you need to abide by. We're in the sensory lab here at the Dairy Goat Cooperative and the team are taste testing and they have got a whole lot of samples of infant formula and they are checking across to make sure that there's consistency throughout entire batches. And that those are really important um, but it is, it is a very highly regulated uh, food category and we have a number of people here in our quality and product development uh, functions who are dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Is dairy goat infant formula something that's produced in other countries or is it quite a unique New Zealand thing? Originally we are the pioneers and leaders in the goat milk uh, infant formula category um, and we still are the world leader uh, in that. Um, there, there are others who are doing it now, um, and particularly up in Europe, there's some emerging competition up there. Um, but, but a lot of others are seeing what we've done and, and seeing that we've been successful at it and, and trying to imitate us. Uh, that's fine, competition is, uh, is, is fine. Um, but we actually operate in a really small segment of the market, a, a really small niche of the infant formula market. So, you know, there's not a lot of room there for too many. I think the, the most special things about dairy goat infant formula, if you go back to the basics of, of the raw material, goat milk, is that the, the goat milk has a different uh, protein and fat structure to, to cow milk. And so um, there's, there's research that we're doing at the moment and which has been done in the past which has shown that it can be more easily digested or tolerated, um, and particularly by infants who, whose digestive systems aren't that well developed. Uh, so we're finding that uh, many people who um, can't tolerate a cow milk based formula can actually tolerate uh, a, a goat milk based formula because it's, it's more gentle on the digestive system basically. So there's a group of, uh, there's a segment, a small segment in each market who uh, find a lot of value in being able to switch to, to a goat milk formula based product. And do you produce different types of formula? We do produce different types of formula here for different age groups. Um, we have um, the basic infant formula from birth all the way through to products up to children for between five and six and seven years of age. So basically they require different formulations, different levels of fat and protein and minerals and so on 
uh, for the different uh, age groups and, and the growing children. Um, but we also have to produce different formulations for different markets as well because there are slightly different regulations in different markets around the world. We meet with Tony at one of the Dairy Goat Cooperative goat farms to learn the differences between cow and goat farming. I've been dairy goat farming for about three years now. And what did you do before that? Uh, this year dairy farmer, yeah, dairy, or dairy cow farmer, yeah. And what made you decide to switch to goats? Uh, it's, it's something I've been interested in for a fair while. Um, yeah, I found them a lot, a lot nicer animals to work with. Uh, it's a lot, a lot more varied. Um, it's, I find it's easier on staff, it's easier to hold staff, they seem to enjoy it more. Yeah, a lot more fun. What's the main differences between dairy cow farming and dairy goat farming? Uh, the, the smell and the poo side of it's probably probably a big part, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, they're a lot nicer animals, just, just working with them in general, they're a, they're a lot more social animal, yeah. And tell us about the system you run, so obviously these guys are all inside, so how does it work? Well we supply the dairy goat co-op and as, as part of that we have a um, sort of a philosophy that we, we want to have about 75% of their diet in fresh forage. Um, so although they live in barns, they do get most of their feed um, is harvested and either made into silages and then put through a mixer wagon and fed to them, or it um, gets cut with a, a mower and fed out to them once a day as well. Yeah. So you're growing most of your own feed here? We do, yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of support blocks as well, so we grow all our own grain and barley and that sort of stuff as well, yeah, and try to be self-sustained. And is, is it a similar type of like day-to-day -day operation in, um, in terms of twice-a-day milking and things like that? Yeah, yeah, it's fairly similar to, to cows in that respect, yeah, so we still have milking at, you know, milking at five for two to three hours and, and again in the afternoon and, and feeding out and and daily chores, you know, maintenance and that sort of stuff, yeah. How much milk on average does a dairy goat produce every day? Yeah, I guess at their peak they, they produce sort of, uh, well a, a yearling will sort of do about three litres and a, and a mature doe will do between five and seven litres. And yeah. then annually, how much? Milk solids, uh, depending on what sort of feed you put into them, well our, our aim anyway is to do uh, about 120 milk solids a day this, this coming season, yeah. And what's the uh, average life cycle of a, a dairy goat? They live to be, depending on how well they produce, because we, we herd test them a lot and, and cull just you know, like with dairy cows again. Uh, you know, a good one will go till they're about eight, eight years old, yeah. And what's it like being part of the cooperative? It's, it's great, yeah. It's a lot better than a lot of um, other suppliers that are out there, I think, and that we've got um, uh, security on, on how much we're going to get paid. You know, it's not a, it's not a commodity that we're selling on open market. That's sort of I've got um, somewhere to sell it into, so we know, we know where it's going. Can you tell us about the differences between farming dairy goats, mainly indoors versus outdoors? Uh, well, the majority of people farm indoors for animal health reasons. Um, outdoor ones are a lot more susceptible to um, diseases and parasites, worms. Uh, they get pneumonia quite easy from changes in temperature. Um, and they're a lot easier to manage, to manage indoors as well, yeah. Can you tell us about the breeding of uh, dairy goats? We've been told like the likes of Kidding Down is a lot more condensed on dairy goat farms than say it is on a, on a dairy cow farm. So it's quite common for dairy goats to all cycle and kid down in, in groups, so they'll sort of, they have a 20 day cycle, same as a, same as a cow, um, but they'll sort of stay, you know, so you might have the majority of them all come through in the first 10 days and then they'll sort of taper and then bang again with another group, yeah. So I guess it's pretty chaotic around kidding down time then? Yeah, I mean they all sort of, well the majority of them will have two um, and then some three and even, even a couple have four. Uh, yearlings will tend to have a, a single most of the time. But um, yeah, I mean you get down here in the morning with the lights on and you can have, um, you know, if you've had 50 does have kids in the night, you're, you know, you're looking at 80 to 100, 100 babies running around, you've got to match up and find out who's had what. So just making sure you've got enough people around to um, get the jobs done here yeah, so nothing gets missed and the animals are all happy. Do you have many birthing difficulties with multiple births? Uh, no, no, surprisingly not. No, goats, goats are pretty good at, um, at helping themselves. Um, we might have to help maybe one in, one in a hundred, I guess, yeah. But I mean, you can blink and they've, they've popped one out. Pretty, <laughs> they're pretty quick, yeah. And what sort of staffing do you have to have here to, to help you? So we run three full-time labour units here at the moment and then in the springtime we'll look to have maybe two or three more casuals help out just, just during that busy sort of couple of months um, and then we'll go back down to three. Uh, the shed's mainly automated, it's got automatic um, cup removers and backing gates so we don't need a lot of, a lot of labour involved in the milking side of it. So, What are goats like to work with? <laughs> Uh, they're great, yeah they're great, they're all friendly, I mean you can come into the barns anytime you like and there's always at least 10 that'll 
want to give you a scratch uh, jumping in there and, and trying to clean their water troughs, uh, which we, we try and do at least twice a week, can be a fun exercise. Um, you'll usually get, get mauled by, by a few of them and get your pants on that and your overalls chewed on. Um, yeah, no, they're good fun. I've heard about the three minute challenge where you have to try and stand in with the goats for, for three minutes. We get suppliers to come in and stand with the goats for three minutes. Is that true? Nah, not, not that I've heard of, okay. but um, it, it would definitely be a challenge, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to come out dry anyway, yeah. We're talking with Tony about the Dairy Goat Cooperative business and the challenges of growth. A cooperative is basically a group of farmers, uh, in our case dairy goat farmers, who have got together and said that collectively we can do a lot more than if we were individuals. And so what, what the farmers do is they say we've got a raw, raw material, we're going to employ some people to add value to that raw material, manufacture it and, and sell it so that we can focus on our farming operations. So that's basically what a cooperative is. In our case, the farmers are the owners of this company, of the cooperative, so they own it, um, and they also supply milk to it. Can you tell us about the differences between your overseas markets? We've got over 20 overseas markets, and basically none of them are the same, and that, that's the really interesting thing about exporting. While we've got um, you know, a, a product, a very similar product that we send to each market, um, what's required to sell that product effectively in each of those markets can be quite different. So there'll be different distribution channels, there'll be different pricing, there'll be different tariffs. Um, and, and, and with our products in particular, um, you have to rely on uh, talking to doctors and health professionals a lot rather than the end consumer. So um, that, that can vary quite a lot in the different markets as well. So sort of one thing I've learned over the years uh, with, with markets and market development is that no two of them are the same and you have to actually uh, adjust your strategy for each of the individual markets. Do you have staff based overseas? Uh, we have a small office in, in Spain where we support our European operations. So uh, that is designed to help our partners in those markets um, uh, market the products uh, under our brand. Um, but we don't have any other uh, offshore people. It's, it's otherwise all located here and we do all the travelling overseas from here. So you've invested really heavily in plant. Where does that plant come from? We, we have invested heavily in plant over the years um, and, and our assets are around about 150 million uh, in, in total. Um, the, the spray dryer is the most, probably the most complex part of, of, of the operation, largely uh, are made here in New Zealand um, through, through an overseas company, but largely here. Um, New Zealand has one of the you know, foremost uh, stainless steel fabricating uh, operations here um, and, and a lot of it does get done here locally which is really great. What have been the challenges involved with um, a growing staff base throughout the years? As we've grown from, from a small company to a larger one with over 200 staff now, um, there's been a number of factors. One has been that we've become more specialised in the functions that we do. Um, a lot of our specialist functions are around manufacturing, uh, quality systems, uh, product development, market development, those sort of things. We have science people here supporting our markets as well. Um, but we have had a philosophy of, of making sure that the people we do bring into the company fit the culture really well, um, and that's really important, and we try and invest as much in training and development along the way as we can. But as, as the business gets bigger, more and more people, um, you realise that people are your most valuable asset and uh, we have a really good uh, staff retention here. I mean, people do like working here, which is really great. Over the last 30 years, the Dairy Goat Cooperative has had a huge journey of growth, starting off as a collective with just a few farmers through to today with 70 plus farmers and this amazing $100 million plus facility. As part of my experience, the team here have arranged for my very own dairy goat milk infant formula taste testing. So here goes. Mmm, that's pretty good. Can you tell us about your typical dairy goat farmers? What's their background? Did they used to be dairy farmers and, and that sort of thing? Most of our uh, dairy goat farmers uh, did begin out as, as dairy cow farmers. Um, we've got a number 
uh, of farmers at the moment who have been in the co-op you know, for its entire history, which is fantastic. And we've obviously got a number of people who have joined the industry in the last three or four years as well as, as we've sought extra milk supply. Um, some of those have come from a dairy cow background. Some of them are still dairy cow farmers and they have a dairy goat farm next door sort of thing. Some are uh, sheep and beef farmers. So there is a real mixture um, of uh, farmer uh, members in our cooperative. Most people know a lot about uh, dairy cow farming. Mm -hmm. What are the differences and, and what's special about dairy goat farming? I think uh, what's appealing to a lot of dairy goat farmers is that the smaller uh, blocks of land that are perhaps um, you're seeing less of in the dairy cow industry, the sort of 40 hectare blocks, are, are actually quite suitable for, for a good sized dairy goat farm of maybe you know 600 goats or so. And so that, that is a bit of an appeal for it. I think a lot of farmers also really, really love the goats. They really like working with them and find them to be a, a lovely animal to work with. Um, so I think those are a couple of the real, real things that, that attract people to the industry. What capacity have you got here to continue to grow and when might you need to um, invest further in capital here? We've invested in quite a lot of uh, capital manufacturing facilities over the last five or six years, the biggest of which was the number two spray dryer, which cost us $70 million. That's actually given us quite a lot of um, latent capacity for the next you know, five to ten years. Uh, so we don't believe that we've got any major capital works required in, in that period. So we can really just focus on our market growth. Our business is uh, continuing to grow and we, we see it growing in the future. Uh, we have a lot of the infrastructure here in place now with our manufacturing facilities, quality systems and so on. Uh, but basically our growth is just going to continue to come from further market development. We have about uh, 25 markets uh, that we market our products to at the moment. Uh, around the world and we would expect that to grow and that our business will grow with that ongoing market development. And are you going to be able to source enough milk here in New Zealand? Yes, we, we uh, were able to uh, bring on extra suppliers when we needed it over the last three or four years and we believe that the next phase of our growth we will similarly be able to source the milk here from New Zealand. Um, we, we've got 72 suppliers you know, supplying us at the moment and uh, you know, in the context of the, the whole New Zealand industry, if you like, that, that's not a big number of farms, so we don't believe that um, securing extra milk will be an issue if, if and when we need it. It's been a huge journey of growth for the Dairy Goat Cooperative over the last 30 years. They started with just a small collective of farmers, and now there's over 70 farmers in this $100 million plus facility, and they're exporting to many different countries. All of this is ready to be shipped off this afternoon. We'll see you next time on Thinking Forward.